Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Royzen. Take it away. Thank you, Jerry, and thank all of you. Um, you're going to get to live a lot longer, younger. So it won't be thinking about yourself as 90 or 100 or 110 if you make it that age, because you're going to be rebooted back to 40 or 50. So that's what the gist of the science is. And I'm going to go through a little of the science to show you how you can enjoy living younger, longer. Um, let me get to the screen. So I do work at uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and um, this is taken from uh, that book, The Great Age Reboot, but we did a series of reboot workshops, if you will, and the reboot workshops um, are entitled, Can You Really Be 40 When You're 90? That is, when your calendar age is 90, can you feel 40? And many of you probably don't think that's possible, but it is very likely that if you make it the next decade, um, that by a decade from now, we're going to be able to reboot ourselves back. If you want, we gave it, we run this series of lectures at the Cleveland Clinic um, that are online and anyone can uh, sign up for them. Um, but they're live, they aren't recorded, um, and you can sign up at Great Age Reboot if you want. Um, but the point that I was making is, uh, this is the set of lectures we're only going to get. These are two hour lectures, so they're 24 hours of lecture. We're gonna try and cover this entire topic, if you will, of all of the things you can do to help you prepare for it. You're not expected to see this now. Um, but I'm gonna go through some of the highlights of the science. We've actually built a curriculum where we teach undergraduate uh, college students that the, the things that you will learn today, you're a genetic engineer. This is a full curriculum for a semester um, at several universities now. And um, we'll go through just to tell you that's where this comes from. So this is the, the way of, of doing it. Let's go back now and talk about aging and why we think this is so. Um, if you look at life expectancy, which is on this axis, and so you see 55, if you were born in 1920, uh, you're expected, uh, your life expectancy was around 55. If you look at this, since 1890, life expectancy, and it's blue for women and green for men, women always live about three years longer than men. If you look at it this way, um, you'll see that life expectancy has expanded by about two and a half years every uh, decade since 1890. And it's continued to expand in the developed world it hasn't expanded in middle America due to opioids, but in the rest of America, it's continued and in the developed world, it's continued to expand by about two and a half years every 10 years. But in this next decade, we expect this to be a 30 year jump. I'm gonna show you that. So you saw, I love doing that. So I'm going to do it again, if you will. This huge jump in the next decade and that's because you're going to not live longer and older, but live longer and younger. You're going to be able to reboot yourself based on the science that is occurring. So I'm going to go over a little bit of the development of that science and then why you can do that and what happens to population because of that. So if you will, um, the goals of this to help you think about, discuss with your tribe and um, others, uh, the, and I'm gonna make this curve smaller um, and move it up here, um, your tribe and plan for a younger future. Um, the next part of that is the goals to understand why 90 is likely to be the new 40. That is why when you're 90 calendar years old, you're going to likely be able to be functionally 40. 
that means not only your heart and your brain younger and your muscles younger and your joints younger, but even your skin younger. Um, adopt behaviors that change outcome so that you can climb that and when the reboot comes, you're going to be available for it and to educate associates, friends and family about why longevity can be a benefit. Everyone, and, and this really started and I'll come back to that. It started when we testified in front of Congress and Senate Committee on Health, Health Education, Labor and Pensions uh, about um, why this was likely and why we should have an incentive for Medicare um, people to, like the Cleveland Clinic does, to be able to get ready for this, um, meaning to give you some of your insurance money back if you get to a point where you're ready for it. Um, the CBO piped in and said, no, everyone over 65 is a cost to society, not a benefit. So it's really to show you why they're so wrong and uh, to be able to um, think about why they're so wrong and to think about and start to discuss for the probable demographic and economic shifts. And then to give you a thought piece to discuss and a head start on your own being younger tomorrow. So you're going to see us do several calculations of population later on, um, but it isn't due to fertility rates. The fertility rates are declining, which means that everyone worries about there won't be enough young people to support the old people. You won't have to worry about that because you're going to get to be a young person again. What do I mean? Well, if you're going to live to 115 or 120, you're not going to want to retire at 65. So you're still going to be um, working and paying into Social Security and Medicare, et cetera. Secondly, it's not due to the change to immigration. The immigration projections we have are the same as the average for the last 13 years. It's not that that is not what's going to change population. What will change the population demographics is in fact this you living longer that exponentially greater years means that the population will be tilted towards older people. And you say, well, wait a second, you didn't even show what happened to the pandemic in 1910 in the, the Spanish flu pandemic. And you'll notice it doesn't even show here. And the reason is, and, and before I go into that, I'm gonna go over it again in a second is, it bounced back fast. The initial gain in life expectancy of the first 50 or 60 years of this was due to childhood immunizations and benefits and sanitation that benefit younger populations. For the last 60 years, we've been improving due to um, health improvements for older populations. The next decade is when we'll see this rebooting back because of the research into aging mechanisms. That is, you're going to actually be able to be rebooted younger um, with at least an 80% probability. It's not 100%, but all 14 areas of research that are expanding exponentially um, have now been tried in at least two animal species and able to reboot specific animal species back in age. So we expect that one of those, and they're now, as you'll hear, creeping into human trials, we expect these to be available um, within the next decade. So if you look at the pandemic of 1719, um, it men, and were, again, were living less long than women, but both of them had a 12 year decrease during the pandemic year in what's called periodic life expectancy. And here it is, they rebounded fast back. Um, the, they rebound fast in the past and we expect that to occur in the next year or two very quickly. Um, we have two really pandemics, opioids and COVID-19. Um, we don't know whether the, op the epidemic from opioids will rebound in the middle of the country. It has rebounded on the coasts already. 
um, but COVID-19 uh, still, we think, will be uh, gone and not having a life expectancy, and if you will, effect. Um, and it really is not understanding the science. So I blew this up. So the figures the CDC reported as periodic life expectancy. That is, they've reported that COVID-19 has shortened life by about two years. But really, that's what we call periodic life expectancy. What would happen if everyone died of the same cause at the same rate as they did during the pandemic year? Well, they're not going to hopefully die of a pandemic in 2024, 2025. Um, and that is that, if you will, the short decline in life expectancy is likely to prove, if you'll pardon the expression, short-lived. The pandemic's indirect effect on the more meaningful, what we call cohort life expectancy, that is how long will you live is likely to be positive, meaning the advances in virology and vaccine technology have been so great, as you'll see, as we'll talk about in a little bit, that's even filtering in to treatments now that will extend and reboot you back. And I'll give you a, a hallmark of that. What happens if we have a cell on our old cells we have a marker, a specific protein marker that say they're an old cell and they're making the cells around them function older. Well, if you develop a virus against that marker, you can knock out all the old cells and you will regrow, recycle those into young cells and act younger with the cells around it acting younger. So that is why we expect this exponential gain. If you look at populations, and this is the Census Bureau pop prediction, it's no, we're no different than they are. Where we're different is in, if you look at the populations as you get older, a lot more older people will exist. That will change an awful lot. Um, but if you look at where the growth is in young people, both we and the Census Bureau predict about a 6.4% grain over the next 30 years. But it is in us older people that will have the biggest gain over, in fact, the majority of the gain in population will be in the older people. And it's already beginning to happen as we'll go through in a few minutes. That is 60% of the gain in population we expect by 2050. If you say this population is going to be going up by 117 million and not the estimate from the Census Bureau of 35 million, it changes the economics of a whole bunch of things, such as if you're going to live healthily a lot longer, you're not going to move out of your home as quick um, to go to a retirement community. Let me go back and talk about how I learned about aging in medical school way back in the late 60s, early 70s. We were taught that you hit your maximum function of every organ between 25 and 35, and that you declined by about 5% every uh, decade after that. What do I mean by that? That whether you look at heart function, it declines your pumping ability, by about 5% every decade. What about um, kidney function? Again, 5% every decade. And liver, brain, um, every organ of our body declines, bone mass, muscle mass, um, declines at about 5% a decade. Um, but my favorite study of all was an IQ of Harvard physicians. And you'll notice their IQs go down at about 5% every decade. It may be why you want to choose a relatively young physician. But in fact, if you look at the error bars, a lot of them go through no change or in fact, even an increase. In fact, 25% of them do. And so I started studying why it was that you could maintain function till very near the end. Um, 
what we now know is there are 33 things that have been shown in at least four studies in humans. We'll go through a few of these later on. Everything from managing stress to doing speed of processing games, to having olive oil and salmon, um, to uh, flossing and seeing a dental professional, uh, to smelling four different smells a day, um, or enjoying blueberries. There are whole bunches of things that have been shown in at least two studies in humans to diminish the rate of dementia as we get older. Um, and keeping your brain healthy is one of the things we know you can do now. If you look at these two studies out of Chicago cohorts, diet alone decreased the risk of dementia by 60% irrespective of genes. So even if you had the worst gene um, proportion, E4, E4, you would still have a 60% reduction from your risk by just following a healthy diet. We know, for example, that having smaller amounts of food damage the mitochondria less at any meal. So what are the mitochondria? The mitochondria take fat and glucose and produce ATP. When you're young, say when you're five years old, a molecule of glucose coming in here produces 32 molecules of ATP. By the time you're 70 or so, it's only 16 molecules of ATP. Why? Because you've damaged your mitochondria with what we call overwhelming your, your in-cell antioxidant capacity. It's not the antioxidants you eat, it's the antioxidants in the cell, which are only three, catalase, glutathione, and SOD. So if you, how do you overwhelm them? Because you eat too much sugar or too big meals causes damage. So to keep younger longer, we know that one of the things is to have fewer errors by having smaller meals and less sugar. I think I asked this question last year or two years ago when I was at the JCC, your JCC, what's the worst day um, for our mitochondria? And there are two worst days in, uh, if you will, Super Bowl Sunday and Thanksgiving, because we overwhelm our in-cell in antioxidant capacity. Some of the things you can do to build that up are blueberries, coffee, and exercise build your in-cell antioxidant capacity up. Slowing aging is what we've been doing up to now. That's actually reducing the damage in cells. And then when the cells replicate, they don't replicate the damaged cell, they replicate a less damaged cell. That's what's happened so far. But you can tell by the point I put rejuvenation versus something else, there is something else. And that's the reboot that has been occurring in test tube studies for the last 30 years. And in the last two or three years, in the last three or four years in animal studies. And now um, just in the last year gotten into human studies, human trials. That is, there are some people already benefiting from this. What we know with rejuvenation is that you can live at the top of your curve till very near the end. And that's with those 33 things I showed you. But now we're going into something different. And the something different really was occasioned by the Human Genome Project. Um, and I know, um, and, and uh, Jerry, you can stop me at any one time if I'm getting too deep in the science, um, but, there, but each of you is a genetic engineer. What do I mean by that? Well, you may not have gone to MIT or Caltech, but you are at least as good an engineer as anyone went there, and I'm going to show you that. So when these Human Genome Project, there were two, one was Francis Collins at NIH and the other was Craig Venters in a private company. And what they expected to find was 300,000 genes um, because that's how much DNA we had in our nuclei. But in fact, they found only 22,500 genes. What was the rest of the DNA? 
Well, it was called junk DNA initially, but eight years later, it was found out it was really rheostats or switches that control your genes. So those are called the epigenes and they turn on or off your genes. All genes are is protein producing factories and whether they're on and producing proteins or off, that individual gene is controlled by your epigenes. The incredible thing is you control over 80% of the epigenes, whether they're on or off. So found 22,500 genes, only 1,500 of them are producing proteins at any one time. So here's what stress management does. Where they're red, those genes are on. Where they're green, they're off. So they went through a stress management program at N1, and at N2, 16 weeks later, many of these genes that were red and on are now off. And M is a year later, and they're off even further um, then. Let's see if I can make this smaller, sorry. They're off even further then. Conversely, these genes down here, which were green, are turned on by the stress management program. What are these genes in here? And these are strips of genes, by the way, from 52 different people. Um, and these 52 went through that stress management program at N1. These are genes that cause inflammation, that produce proteins that highlight or increase inflammation in you. Conversely, the genes that are anti-inflammatory are turned off. Stress management alone turns off or on around 260 genes. So in the schematic of a chromosome, this is the chromosome, and here is a set of genes, and you've got a whole bunch that are tight on a thimble. Those are off. When they're unwound, mRNA can come from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, line up against this and be able to form in the right letters. It then goes back to the, the cytoplasm and you form proteins. That's how it works. So you unravel or untangle some of the uh, chromosomes, some of the uh, DNA that's on the um, thimble. So it's, that's, it's as simple as this unwinding and winding that you control by your actions. And there's a chemical way you actually do that. So we found 22,500 genes. By 18, you control about 80% of which of your genes are on or off. So by doing stress management, you're controlling 260 of those 22,000 genes. In fact, we now know that you control over 17,000 of the genes by your multiple actions, whether they're on or off. Let me give you another example that I think I showed you last year. This is, again, a heat map where the red is genes that are on. Again, 52 strips of genes, it turns out. These are guys with prostate cancer. This is a year later. As you notice, they took these genes from on to largely off. What are these five? They're the RAS family of genes that promote the growth of prostate, breast, or colon cancer. What happened to turn those genes off? The three guys who smoke stopped smoking. All 52 eliminated five foods from their diet. They walked 10,000 steps a day and they did stress management for 15 minutes morning and night. That's all. Conversely, up here, where they were off and turned on, what are these two genes over here? These two genes over here produce the GSTM1 protein that causes breast, colon, and prostate cancer cells uh, to kill themselves, to commit suicide. So over this one year period, these guys turned the genes that promote breast, colon, and prostate cancer off, and they turned on the genes that cause the cancer to commit suicide. Well, this is 14 years later, and one of the co-authors is a urologist, Pete Carroll. I asked him what had happened a couple of years ago, and he said that only one of the 52 
had progressed beyond these lifestyle changes to need more treatment for their prostate cancer, as opposed to, I think it was 29 of the 52 in the comparison group. It wasn't randomized controlled, obviously. Um, but that's remarkable, and you could use this for breast cancer or colon cancer. It's the same effect. You get to control an amazing number and percentage of your genes. So all genes do is make proteins or watch other genes. Which genes are on or off, it's largely under your control. You are a genetic engineer. So what's happening here isn't just the olive oil is doing some good, the olive oil is actually changing which of your genes are on. Let me give you the example of physical activity. When you do those 10,000 steps, or when you stress a muscle, you turn on a gene that produces a small protein called arisen. The arisen goes across your blood-brain barrier into your brain, and it in turn turns on another set of factors that release brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, which is like miracle growth for your brain, which makes your memories better. So by doing physical activity, you turn on a gene that turns on another gene that causes you to have a better memory. So that's why physical activity, one of the reasons at least why physical activity is so good for um, increasing memory power. So that's where we are now. We know that 60 is now the new 40. And in fact, that's what we predicted when we did re the Real Age book in 1998. Um, and in fact, if you look at it um, in the studies, uh, in the nurses' health study and the health professionals' follow study, total of about 110,000 people, that's what's happened. If you look at it, if they do healthy behaviors, they, have, they live about 11 years more chronic disease free and another 11 years total. So they live about 22 years longer than people who don't do those behaviors. And in fact, when we looked at the Medicare databases, the key was in fact um, six choices. That is if you get to six normals plus two, you have only 10 to 20% of the risk of all the others. And so um, Jerry, I'm sure you remember that we talked about 10,000 steps a day and the four components of physical activity that contribute to this. The problem is in America, even in the group that should know the most, the nurses, only 4% of them did it. Those 4% had a 90% reduction in chronic disease. And men were worse, if you will. Oops, let me go back. Um, huh. Men were worse uh, in that only, um, if you will, 1% of the men, as opposed to 4% in the nurses' health study, only 1% of the men got to six normals plus two. How important are they? Well, this is one of them is blood pressure. And I show you here that if you didn't treat the blood pressure in the control group and we had lousy drugs, reserpine or hydrochlorothiazide in that era, um, that um, it was a 36% morbidity and mortality uh, over the five years that they had high blood pressure untreated compared to treated in the treated group. And again, they were lousy drugs. It was a 6% or a six-fold reduction. That's how important those six plus two outcomes are. Um, as I said, Swedish men, only 1% did it. Why are we so expensive for medical care in the United States? Over the age of 18, only 2.7% of us get to six normals. And when we hit 65, it's 0.6%. So that's the most important question. How do we motivate people to get there? What are they? Their blood pressure, their body mass index, their your fasting blood sugar, their your LDL cholesterol, their no cotinine tobacco end products in the urine, they're doing a stress management program and then seeing a primary care provider and your immunizations up to date. 
Is it possible to change behavior? Yeah, by giving large incentives, and this is what we testified in front of Congress to try and get them to do for Medicare. When we gave large incentives to our employees, we went from 6% to now 44.9%, with almost 74% participating in the program. We give back 30% of their premium back to them, um, which is the maximum allowed by law. What has it enabled us to save? Well, if you finish this through 2020, we've now saved $1.3 billion for 101,000 employees. That is, the Cleveland Clinic has not spent $1.3 billion that it would have spent were it still on its trend line or were it one of our competitor organizations at the median. In addition, our employees have saved over 200 and, well, now it's over 350 million in direct premiums and probably seven or 800 million in co-pays. But now we think that something even bigger, but you've got to get there to prepare for this. But we think something even bigger can occur. That is, we're going to be able to reboot back um, to a much younger age. I'm just checking time, I'm sorry. I didn't have my stopwatch on. Um, and um, what, what is that? Um, that is that you're going to be able to benefit from the 14 areas of exponentially increasing research. That is since 1992, every year, the amount of money and the number of patents in age-related research, aging mechanisms research, has gone up by about 30%. And if you look at it, what that means is there's a huge, huge um, benefit in this mechanism of aging. So instead of just living at the top of your curve, you're going to be able to extend that top of your curve for a lot longer. That is, as I've said, this is what we expect to happen. Now I'm going to go through some of those 14 areas so you'll see what's happening. I alluded to a virus or vaccine um, against a senolytic cell. What happens when we have old cells? The old cells we have make the neighboring cells old. So one of the reasons people develop heart failure or abnormal heartbeats when they get old is they get an old cell that isn't functioning. And then much like a piece of rotten fruit, it makes the cells around it dysfunctional. And if it makes enough of them dysfunctional, you have an interruption in the electronic pathway in the heart or your heart cells contract just a little out of rhythm. So your ejection fraction goes down what happens in every one of our organs. The interesting thing is we develop senolytic cells from day one we're born. In fact, even before we're born, we're developing, but our immune system gets rid of them. Sometime around age 30, our immune system stops being efficient at getting rid of them. They build up and cause us to dysfunction as we get older. So one of the areas is, can we take that away? This started in 19, this is a review article in 2005, but it was an experiment done in 1967 at UC San Francisco, where they gave the blood of a young rat to an old rat. What happened? The old rat became young and the young rat became older. Well, that was the genesis in Silicon Valley about two years ago of a company forming that would give young blood to people who paid an awful lot of money for it um, from specific donors. But in fact, even better than that is um, studies using small molecules that did the same thing. So on, in 2020, Ned Davis, which is a spinoff company from Mayo Clinic, reported on a phase one study of a drug that harvests old cells or placebo into knee joints of people with arthritic pain. The data from the 12 patients in the highest dose group indicated that compared to placebo, 
the drug took away 80% of the pain and restored 80% of the function for at least three months. The senolytic harvested old cells, and without those senolytic cells, the surrounding cells acted young again. The pain disappeared. The joint became actually uninflamed, and the increased ability, obviously, for those people to be young and productive increased dramatically. This drug also worked on the spinal cord. Unfortunately, it failed in phase two, not because it didn't work, but because they gambled, the company gambled, and went for a um, small number of patients in this phase two trial. It's now being resurrected in a, another phase two trial, but the initial one um, failed statistically. But the convoys, they're the ones who originally did the young blood into old blood experiment, did something different they actually started therapeutic plasma exchange. In humans, we already do this procedure for um, MS and myasthenia gravis and ALS. It takes about two hours and it comes with no or mild side effects. And the convoys, what they did is they replaced half the plasma in mice with saline containing 5% albumin. Essentially, they're washing your plasma. So this is what it looks like in humans. You pump blood out, you filter it, you give the cells back to the person and the plasma you clean up and you give fresh plasma to the patient. Um, what happened in the mice, muscle, brain, and liver tissue essentially became young again. That's a pretty easy thing to do since it's already FDA approved technique. And in fact, we've now got one study called the AMBAR study, which tried this in Alzheimer's disease patients. And I'm going to show you the results. This is now available. This is in a phase 2B3 trial. There are some places doing this as well, and I'll tell you how you can actually get paid to do this. But this is the results of it. If you look at the mild Alzheimer's disease, the treatment groups actually retained and recovered cognitive function, whereas the placebo group went to a lower level. Um, and again, it was the study started in Spain. It was done in three countries, Spain, Chile, and the United States, Cleveland Clinic and University of Pittsburgh were the sites in the universe in the in the United States. But you'll see improvement in the control group. This is on uh, one test of uh, cognitive function. Here's another test of cognitive function. Again, the treatment group improvement over 15 months, the uh, control group de declined. And this is even in, in perception of function. Um, as you may know, Alzheimer's patients don't know that they're failing. Um, once they start to fail significantly, whereas the caregivers thought they were improving dramatically. And when you look at um, the activities of daily living, they were improving compared to even normal or baseline or the placebo group. So that's one of the areas. Um, Pittsburgh in the United States is now doing this commercially. Since it isn't FDA approved, it's a cost but you can get it free since anytime you want to donate plasma, you can donate plasma and donating plasma does exactly the same thing. That's how a lot of young people um, pay their way through college. Um, they donate plasma and they get paid for it. And that's essentially a small donation. If you did it the way it was done in the AMBAR study, um, let me go back just to show you in the AMBAR study, they donated plasma once a week for eight weeks and then once a month through six months. And then they followed these people and they kept getting better and better. They've now followed them for about 21 months and the curves continue to go upwards, although they haven't published that data, they say. So that's one of the 14 areas, harvesting old cells. Another is fasting. Fasting turns on a recycling of your old cells into your young cell, into making young cells. 
So when you fast for a period of time, say uh, either intermittent fasting for 16 hours a day or fasting for three days in a row or going on what we call fasting mimicking diet where you eat fewer calories a day consistently for a number of days, um, that re gets to recycle your old cells into young cells. Gene editing is another one of these 14 areas where um, with heart failure patients, they produce an abnormal protein called an amyloid protein, just like amyloid to the heart, to the brain, but they produce an amyloid that attaches to certain heart cells that causes those heart cells to malfunction. Well, with gene editing, you can use a virus and edit that new, that gene that produces that abnormal protein out. And guess what? In six people that they've done this in in Australia, instead of having a two to four month life expectancy due to heart failure, they now have 18 years of uh, life expectancy. So we're going to see gene editing and we're now getting to the point where we can edit out the genes that may promote aging. Another one is stem cells and telomere regeneration. Turns out most of the stem cell treatments in the United States are a fraud where they're just taking your money. Um, there are only three approved stem cell um, treatment protocols in the entire United States. But in Israel, they've been giving hyperbaric oxygen in a novel way, and I'll come back to what that is, and that regenerates stem cells in every organ studied. And let me show you what it does. So this is right after stroke, and they were comparing ischemic stroke versus hemorrhagic and, and this novel way of giving hyperbaric oxygen. And I'll tell you what that novel way is in a second, but you'll notice the improvement in function is over 75% in all of the groups. And in men, the men in this experiment, 13 of them, allowed their, to get skin biopsies. Actually, they had 13 skin biopsies. And you'll notice that their skin returned, increased both the density of collagen and the density of elastin and the elastin, if you will, fiber length. Very important. So they actually restored skin to a younger purpose. purpose. So what is that, if you will, that technique of novel hyperbaric? They go to two liters, two atmospheres, sorry, and then down to one atmosphere, then to two, then to one, then to two, then to one. Why did they do this? Well, in animal models, they noticed that if you were at one atmosphere and went to three quarters of an atmosphere, which risks some damage from lack of oxygen, you started regenerating stem cells. And they found that if they went from two to one, it fooled the body into thinking it was going from one to a half. It fooled the body into thinking that there was a problem with oxygen and they had to generate stem cells to repair it. So they've gone two to one, two to one, two to one. It's now available at the villages in uh, Florida and uh, coming to several other places. It's in Abu Dhabi as well as in Israel and the data look very good. When you talk to the person who does this, um, he's, it is really um, quite solid science, um, but it's only been done by one group. Anything that's only been done by one group, you worry, is it going to be able to be reproduced by other groups? The villages is a different group doing it and appears to be able to be repeated in my conversations with the medical director there. Proteostasis is getting rid of abnormally um, designed proteins and there's mitochondrial regeneration. Remember I told you the mitochondria were important in um, energy. So let's see if I've got that, oops, I don't. So let me go back to that, that slide. Um, so fat, 
is all, um, if you will, from the same multipotent fat. It turns into white fat in us as we get old, which creates inflammation and ages us. Um, and is an association with type two diabetes and many other problems. Brown fat is what we have as kids. And we secrete this because we have many more mitochondria that produces heat and keeps us warm when we're not in a warm area. So that's why we have it when we're young. But in mitochondrial regeneration, what you're able to do is take this white fat, regress it to pluripotent fat, and then turn on the brown fat gene. What would happen? We'd eliminate diabetes. And that's been done in three animal species, uh, mice, rats, and lamb. I didn't realize that, that diabetes and, and obesity is a problem in lambs, but they develop hepatic disease from it like um, we do, if you will. Um, if you will, non-alcoholic uh, hepatitis um, is from fat in, um, in humans, while the lambs develop it at much higher rate and causes of problems. So at uh, um, one of the universities in the agriculture community, they